Soy Goyal Hav. Welcome to Goyal Hav. Today I have with me Daniel Lee, who is a marketing director at um, Char Alan Charles Asia Publishing, um, which sort of separates into a few imprints. Um, and today we're going to be focusing in on Cinerous Books, which is the fiction imprint of that larger umbrella. <laughs> Exactly. Gorgeous logo. I wrote that one a lot. The simplicity, but like clarity. It's 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 kind of funny because it, it's actually, if you look at it properly, it's um it's a Chinese character of person. And technically there's no official translation of Sinoas. It just means Chinese person. And there's person written in Chinese, which is part of the original co the design brief. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> We're like the art, the art of like every little bit of like a logo design and all that. <laughs> it all like, it all like, yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. Um, a little, yes, go ahead, sir. No, 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 you go. It's a little in joke, basically, but anyway, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so why don't you introduce Cinoist and sort of talk a little bit about um, what as an imprint you do, and then also a little bit about your role and sort of what, what for people who might not know, what sort of would the, does a daily life as a marketing director at a publisher's look like? So thank you very much, Caitlin. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to your lovely audience. And um, yeah, so I'll just get right into it. Um, ACA Publishing, Alan Charles Asia Publishing is actually my family's publisher. I mean, I, I, uh, uh, the, the publishing house itself, if you really want to trace it way back, probably starts in kind of the late, early 90s, late 80s. And essentially, it was part of a larger publishing conglomerate called Alan Charles Publishing. And essentially, we started off as the Beijing office of that, of that publisher. And it was consisted of my mother being parachuted into Beijing with a suitcase in a hotel room. And over the kind of next uh, 10 years, 10 to 20 years, she grew that into kind of like a 30 person operations, doing primarily kind of B2B magazine sales. So um, this is kind of sort of things like, you know, metal prices in Guangzhou province today and stuff like that. And uh, I'm not sure how you familiar you are with that whole model, but let's just say it died a very, very glorious death with the advent of uh, Google AdWords. <laughs> and so this brings us to kind of 08 and I'm just kind of achieving sentience basically. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and kind of my summers were spent like kind of typesetting and kind of sorting through like invoices and stuff like that. That was how I spent my summer holidays. And um, and yeah, and it was uh, it was really fun for me. But it was kind of at the time the company was shrinking, it was shrinking really really badly because the the, the, the underlying business model was supported basically was just gone. And so since then, it was kind of this process of watching my parents kind of navigating the company through this really tricky landscape and watching them kind of um, find their way onto, basically they were looking around and saying, okay, our old business model is gone. We're trimming down our capabilities. What is the core capability we have to maintain in order to remain a publishing house? And the thing that they determined was the editorial capacity. If you don't have editors, you don't have an editorial house. You don't have a sorry. You don't have a publishing house. So they were, they were, they were trying desperately, and they were like looking around and saying, "Okay, what else besides B two B magazine publishing can we do?" And one of the things they landed on was book publishing. I mean, the editors themselves are very familiar with China as a as a as a, as a territory. They they are aware of its intricacies. You basically, they're the editors. You can say like, "Oh, like this elevation. This person is walking from this elevation to this elevation." Like and uh, it took them three days. And the, uh, an editor could look at that and say, like, that's impossible because that's only a kilometer of the elevations. Like, that's a gentle scroll. Like, how did it take them three days sort of thing? And um, it's kind of, they're, they're very, very knowledgeable about China. So, um, so yeah, we kind of start, got started on our core competencies, which kind of business and economic matters, which is where the ACA, the core of the ACA brand is. But then over the kind of, until about after I finished uni and the, the company was just kind of finding its feet again. We were, we were, we stopped trimming people and we started growing once again. And uh, by my mother's saying the water went from the, our nose to our upper lip basically. <laughs> and we were, we were saying like, okay, like what else can we do now? And one of the, the areas we really landed on was like, there's this really good writing coming out of China and there's not a lot being published about it. 
So, and it's like, it's, we, we view that as shame and we view that, okay, can we do anything about that? Uh, at which point we started kind of dipping our toes into about five years ago, like uh, with, with me, like I joined the company about around the same period of time and we started dipping our toes into fiction. And it was a really, really steep learning curve. I mean, the, for example, nonfiction publishing academic stuff, like you don't have to worry about prose at all. It's, it's about facts and figures, right? Facts and figures and stuff like that. You don't have to worry about prose. So like finding the right translators took us a couple of years, finding like, finding like, oh, oh we're, we're supposed to do it this way and not this way. And it's all the little things and cover design as well. So like, for example, like we would at, at the beginning our it's business, business stuff, right? You, you, business people, they're not buying the, the book based on cover. Whereas, uh, whereas, uh, whereas a fiction, I'm not saying you're, they're judging a book by their cover, but it certainly helps. <laughs> <laughs> like it plays a role, you know, exactly. cover is supposed to convey yeah. the information you might want to know about whether you want it. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So with that, we started the Sinos Books imprint really to service kind of this uh, growing kind of literature and uh, fiction market. And today really is our biggest kind of area of growth inside the company where, where that's kind of where we, where we're kind of really finding our feet right now. So yeah, sorry, kind of long story, but uh, that's, uh, that's where, how we arrived at where we are today. I mean, and then when it comes to my role, my, I mean, we're a small press, we're like nine-ish people right now. Um, so uh in a small press you wear multiple hats right so personally like i came from my university background is actually architecture so i came from more of a design-based background and um so really the initial way i got into the company was just kind of like helping out with the covers like doing some dvp stuff and doing like communicating with the kind of printers and stuff like that but then i like my prof as i joined the company more i had my portfolio group so for example i started re being responsible for uh, our socials our our um our uh our, our ai pr material all that sort of stuff uh, getting, getting a say in marketing decisions and then eventually right now kind of like helping out the, the real push this year is kind of events activities and stuff like that to kind of spread the name of the books out there so yeah that's what i do in a nutshell and uh yeah <laughs> have answered everything <laughs> i didn't know i didn't know that first half like everything that was so interesting and um, to like hear about how it was your parents company and it evolved in this way that's um that's quite the origin story that definitely sort of the I'm not it's a unique one <laughs> it's a unique one that's fantastic and you do a very good job may I say Thank at events and um, publicity and there is always events going on and you guys have such a regular um, series of events that are well worth um, watching so if anyone wants to go look at the links down below I would highly recommend them yes please yes please <laughs> there's um, yeah they're so good um, so um, I was wondering a little bit, so something that um, I perceived as a difference with Sinoist books and sort of um, we then talked about and confirmed that I wasn't just, um, you know, <laughs> making things up is that um, as opposed to some other presses um, that might be about um, like Charco Press is about bringing Latin American literature to a largely non-Latin American audience and sort of read defining what their perceptions of Latin American literature might be. Whereas with Sinuis, there is absolutely that huge element to it. Um, but you've mentioned that 30% of your audience is in mainland China orders, um, or it's at least they're ordering from there. <laughs> Um, and that also I feel like um, at a lot of your events, you know, you are building and um, helping um, sustain and develop a community of people who actually might have Chinese heritage or, um, uh, you know, have maybe more connections than um, with some other presses and what's going on there. And I was wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit about that and sort yeah, of your I, editing I, vision. That's, 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 a, that's a really good question. I mean, um, so from our point of view it's we, we have to go where our audience is right and at the end of the day china is china and the kind of diaspora audience is definitely an audience because it's simply because it's so huge and it's so there there's diaspora audiences in the states there's diaspora audience in this country there's this diaspora audience in in kind of uh, australia new zealand etc and all of them 
they traditionally they've I mean, especially in, in mainland China, like learning English is a massive, massive, massive uh, part of like education. And traditionally, how they would learn English is through these kind. Of, they would use these kind of uh, books, like very like the classics, based Jane Eyre, uh, books like that, basically every, stuff that everyone's read. And I mean, that's absolutely fine. You, you experience the beauty of English that way very well. The generation of people have but quite frankly. But the thing is, is that they don't have stories which talk about their experiences. And I think that's what sets us apart. And that's what sets us like, um, uh, uh, kind of like a, a unique kind of, uh, kind of com competitiveness. Anyway, anyway, I'm, I'm trying to talk too fancy. <laughs> um, so, um, it's, but for, for for these people, they 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 want to they they want to read about stuff that like they would understand from from a personal point of view and stuff they've seen personally, but in English, and they and rendered by some of the best translators on this planet. And it's 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 why I think right now that that is that we view that as an incredibly important market and actually kind of bleeds into a little bit about how we produce and editorialize our books. So for example, traditionally speaking. Um, there is like with a lot of um, CDE translation, there is a lot of um, kind of structural editing that goes on, traditionally speaking, where, for example, certain plot points might get trimmed or they might gloss, get glossed a certain way. Or um, I think one, one particular instance I remember is uh, they, uh, one of these people was, uh, it's, a, it's a character that comes from the south of China. And they literally, in, in, their, in their rendering of the translation, they literally, literally gave them a Southern American accent, like a South American accent. <laughs> and I mean, like, that's certainly a, a correct, that's certainly a one way to do it. And it certainly, it makes it engaging to a, a, a kind of like, a, like an audience that reads it, but maybe not the most faithful to the original source material. And um, so our, from our approach format is, is that we would like to carry out as close to authorial intention as we possibly can. And that leads into, for example, how we, uh, how we render our, our translations. We, for example, we never trim anything or, or we never deliberately trim anything unless it's like, for example, completely not relevant to the, the, to the, to the, to the book at all. So for example, like there is like a, an audience, I remember one of the things we trimmed, it was like a, 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 a kind of uh, author who wrote it to a fan. And it was like, and you, you're like, if you're trying to translate that, it doesn't make any sense in this context sort of thing. So that's kind of like stuff, stuff like that gets trimmed. But, um, but uh, from, a, from, a, from, a, from, a, from a kind of pure text perspective, it's as faithful as we can possibly render it onto the original. And that kind of helps um, it kind of helps that kind of English learning audience because they can say like read the Chinese on one hand and then they read the English on one hand they can see like oh this experience is getting rendered into this way and that we, we think that is incredibly valuable to people who are learning English and that's and I think I think to a certain extent it's also to an English speaking audience it's not it's like it, it gives them a more I would say authentic view into into mainland China that maybe isn't uh, not exactly filtered, but at least like due to the prism of a, of like another person's perspective. You see what I mean? Yeah, I was going to pick up on like that specifically. This idea that do you think that um, I mean, was it the case that China was getting more filtered than maybe other countries were, and that more glossed, more trimmed than other literature? Um, was that sort of a feeling that you had? Um. <laughs> I mean, from, it's, it, from, yeah. from, from, it, it's, I mean, it's, it's, China is an incredibly complex place, right? And there's uh, infinite nuances to infinite places. I mean, one of the, one of the uh, things that I keep saying is that China is divided into these big provinces, right? And so the, some of these provinces, they're huge. They're 60 million people. That's the population of France. And it's like, it's like, okay, it's like, some of the books beforehand, it's like, oh, okay, so you you understand Italian, therefore you can go to Paris and no problem, right? So, <laughs> it, I mean, it's, it, it's it's stuff like that, and um, so it from our point of view, yeah, it's definitely there is. I would say, bef I would say traditionally there is publishers when they take on a Chinese property, they have to look at it to the point of sales. They have to. Everyone does. And um, from them, they had to look at they had to look at what is existing out there right now in terms of infrastructure about what's being talked about, 
in, 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 in the market. And right now, a lot of talk, I think one, uh, uh, this, uh, a conversation I had once is like, this is, this is not dissident or poverty porn. I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> And you're like, ah. <laughs> oh dear. And it's like, yeah, I would say there's a there's a bigger range of conversation that can be had, right? <laughs> and um, and really for us, it's about like maybe teasing out, maybe maybe teasing out like things that are interesting to to uh, to uh, to an English audience that like maybe they can identify with at the same time but maybe it's just it's just different enough that they that they it's like it's they're experiencing something new and that's that's really what we are hoping to do at least yeah absolutely so um how would you find those books that you tease out like how does a book find you and obviously you know i you <laughs> i don't expect you to have all the answers about how everything works but like as a brief sort of how does a book um go from existing um to sort of existing via you guys as well <laughs> so we traditionally we i i'm i'm on the production and kind of production and marketing side so i kind of uh, when I get the book, the book has already kind of been ingested into our rights pipeline. And really, it's, uh, it's my mother and my, my mother, and she has a team of friends and family that she like that helps. And, and essentially, they, they go through, we go to, like, for example, book fairs every year, we talk to agents, we talk to uh, Chinese publishers, and we talk about what's exciting, what's, what's, what's like something that's like, uh, that's worth worth talking about, sort of thing. What's what's worth getting excited about, sort of thing. And um, for for my mother, I, I okay, she's not gonna like the fact that I'm saying this, but I get the feeling she she ingests rights based on what she used to read back in uni. <laughs> I mean, same. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's stuff that's kind of topical that we do, and especially on the ACA side and. The, political and you kind of have to remain topical on the nonfiction side but like on the on the on the fiction side really it's about these authors who are adored in China they're prize winning they're 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 they sell out stadiums I've seen I've seen I've seen I've seen literally one person kind of they you know how you sit down at a book signing and they sign off but like literally that that person there was like four or five rows of boxes behind them and in the end all the boxes are gone sort of thing and these people are legends in, inside the inside the inside the kind of Chinese literary space. But once you get abroad, no one's heard of them. No one, no, absolutely no one's heard of them. And that's where we view our kind of opportunity as being, because something made such a massive audience fall in love with them. And at the end of the day, it's simple math, right? China's one fifth of the world. They must be reading something interesting. <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> on those on interesting books like um you know it's sort of the most recent one is uh distant sunflower fields um so everyone go pay attention to this one um but i was wondering if you could talk about um this book and maybe a few other books you've published to sort of highlight some of those authors in particular certainly i i personally adore distant sunflower fields like we we like it was we we it was a great translator, great author, and it was it was just a dream project to work on, really. Um, so this is how our fields is about uh, the author. It's a kind of semi kind of literary memoir, and it's about her, uh, um, her an author and her family, extended family, trying to kind of eke out this existence in this barren land in kind of north northwest China in an area called Xinjiang but not traditionally where you have Xinjiang where the Uyghurs are it's kind of a bit more north than that it's where it's kind of on the Russian and kind of Kazakh and kind of in the Mongolian border right at that region not in Mongolia out of Mongolia border or Mongolia border and um, primarily there are Kazakh people living there and they get the kind of the kind of a little bit more nomadic by nature and they're coming into this land and trying to raise sunflowers and it's uh it's this beautiful story of kind of this small story of kind of interaction between kind of her and her family and her her mother grandmother and her dogs and stuff like that and it's just kind of filled with these really beautiful kind of 
small uh, uh, kind of uh, observations on life. And it, it's, a, it's a beautiful picture. And um, I don't have it, I, have, I only have the galley edition here, but you kind of get a, you get a hint of it through the kind of these images, these beautiful images that uh, I think, I think you, you have the colored edition, don't you? Yes, would you like me to um, <laughs> yes, the, one, please. the ones at the back? Yes, please. Like and yes, so you kind of see it, this, all of this kind of really happened and really went through the author. And she, she, she really did live in that, that situation and kind of uh, that kind of situation for, for that time. And really she's one of those authors that kind of fought her out, way up outside of the mainstream of Chinese publishing because she, she covers an area which is, um, which is like not few, few authors generally go to. And she really, she's outside of these kind of Eastern city kind of, uh, not exactly cliques, but kind of like literary circles that like generally write about uh, Han things basically. And she, she's kind of, she, she fought her way up to the, and really kind of achieved a kind of a renown outside of that. Which is, and especially as a woman writer, a female writer in China, and as a as a as what she does, her writing about her subject matter, that's no mean feat, really. So we, I really enjoyed working. We, we held a couple of events with her. She is the most endearing person in the world. I think you can tell. Uh, links in the description below. <laughs> and um, and she like you, you can you can tell why audiences really fall in love with her, really, and her writing because she, she's very she 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 she's not very good at maybe public speaking and stuff like that but you can you can tell like a lot of careful work has went into like rendering what's what's on the page so yeah it was a it was a really good project to work on we for the cover we actually uh there's a there's a link I somewhere on our yeah we, this. this is like my favorite cover design behind the scenes ever <laughs> We, we, we essentially managed, uh, we, we, I, I got obsessed with paper cutting for a bit and I was like, oh, perfect, a, a, a sunflower cover, yes. So we, we me, it was, uh, I, I conscripted my girlfriend into it as well. And uh, we, uh, we spent like a, a week basically cutting out this and like adjusting in different ways. And eventually we arrived at that cover. It's one of the things I was like, oh, that, that was a dream project to work on, definitely. Um, to go into a couple of the other books, um, one of the things, okay, so first things first, let's do a guilty pleasure of mine personally. And uh, you're gonna you're gonna recoil in horror the size of this book. <laughs> Is it it's looking tall as well? It's not, yeah, it's it's, it's, it's royal, it's royal. It's uh it's uh what is it? It's two two six by one five two, and um it's a it's a big one, let's just say it's a it's a big boy and uh it's uh empires of dust by jiang zilong and it's about kind of uh china uh, the, the the way we kind of framed it we kind of adopted the comp model for it where we we, we framed it as grapes of wrath but set in 50s china and kind of it goes all the way up from kind of 50s china all the way till pretty much the present day as of 2010-ish. Um, and it goes through this entire period of kind of change and massive upheaval and all the bits of history in between that that went went into all of that. That um, but focused on kind of this small in the middle of nowhere village called Guo Jia Bian, literally transformed that trans translated as Guo family shop. Uh, some some point in history, there must have been a shop there at some point, <laughs> and um, and it's it it focuses on this kind of uh, uh, key the central character that kind of is a person of ability, but trapped in an era which doesn't allow him to do much with it, and and kind of it goes into kind of how this history. How history, as it as the big events in of history is happening above his head, how he's kind of riding the cards into kind of what in midway through the book is an incredibly, incredibly tall height. They're industrializing, they're incredibly rich. They've got convoys of kind of uh, foreign-made cars kind of rolling through the street and they're they're on top of the world, but, but that's only the middle of the book, right? And the, the second half of the book is about his fall. And and eventually, and he goes into the reason why he falls, and 
it's it's a story of like for me myself the reason why i'm so attached to it is because this is all history that people in my parents generation went through these are things that around the dinner table that gets talked about and kind of discussed and maybe in kind of new years when we're meeting up with families sharing stories over alcohol uh kind of about kind of these monumentous events and how they viewed through it but the thing is is that for me i only ever got a snapshot and I'm a, I'm a first generation Chinese myself in this country. So it's like my language in my original mother tongue maybe is not the best. So like, I, I only got like maybe a, a passing image of it. And for me, hearing these, reading this in this form really put into context what they were talking about and why they were talking about it and what happened specifically in order to get them to where they were. And it, it, for me, it's kind of, it, it, helped, it helped me a lot to realize like where my parents came from or how, what made them as people. And that to me is incredibly valuable. And maybe it could be to other people as well. I don't know. But uh, that, this is a guilty pleasure of mine personally. And then let's talk about another one, which is a little bit more fun. Uh, uh, Faces in the Crowd by Feng Tai. Again, an excellent cover. 10 out of 10 cover. Thank you, thank you. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a story um, based on turn of the century Tianjin, and it's written by this historical, we're actually doing an event with him. Again, links in the description below. <laughs> Shameless plugs. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a by a, a, an art historian, kind of man of culture, basically, called Feng Zizai. He runs his own he runs his own museum, he writes, he paints beautifully, and he does kind of, he's one of the kind of forefront, he's on the forefront of fighting for cultural preservation in China, because as China's industrialized, literally the, the approach taken was everything old is bad, everything new is good. We must get rid of everything and then replace it with new shiny things, right? And he's one of the kind of few people, especially in the early days, he's one of the few people like saying like, hold on a minute, hold on a minute, some of this stuff's worth keeping. And, and he, he, throughout his life, he really fought for that. And this story is a very, very typical about, it's like a, it's like a crystallization of what he was talking about. It's these small stories of people and kind of places that kind of made old Tianjin what it is. For example, there's a person that runs a steam bun shop and how like he was so busy that like he ignores all his customers. He literally shoves food in their faces and pays for it and then goes back to work. And then there's stories of like art dealers who's able to like kind of tell just by looking at something that something is worth keeping or like it's fake or whatever. And there's like the one particular uh, fun story for me personally is that the one at the end where it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a boxer general. It's a, it's basically a told semi kind of like like mythically, but it's like a boxer general, uh, a boxer rebellion is one of those his historical events, but she's female and she leads this other pack of female and they're kind of rampaging through the streets, kind of fighting God knows what. And it's, it's all of these small stories that kind of maybe time, they, they either get passed down similarly or kind of maybe time's forgotten them a little bit, but like he, he, he preserves them and presents them. And I think that's really, really valuable. And it's fun too. And they're filled with these kind of gorgeous little illustrations. I'll show you one. For example, this one. That's, that's, he, did, he did that himself. That's <laughs> stunning. That's really stunning. And, um, and he, 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 again, he's, uh, he, I think he got his career started off as kind of like a traditionally trained artist. So he is, he is incredibly good at that. And we, this was actually one of our first books, which we brought out in hardback. And which is, which at the time I was really geeking out about because I was finding out all these fancy things about like hardback printing is, ah, oh, it's so fun. You, you can kind of tell like I, what I get excited about here. <laughs> Oh, I'm loving it so much. Is there sort of, you've mentioned like the comp model there, which is like comparison. Mm. Um, and you've mentioned like hardbacks and stuff. Are there things that you find uh, unique to sort of a smaller independent publishing model of marketing? It's, it, it's about fighting for kind of, it's about fighting for everything, right? It's about fighting for shelf space in a bookshop. It's about fighting for, magazine and 
well, inches in a magazine spread and it's about five. It's, it's for that, I mean, from our point of view, one of the things that we really kind of are thankful for is, is that we're the only people here, which is nice. <laughs> I mean, when if like, you, okay, so I would say right now, my job is built on the shoulders of giants, right? Like, I would say going back maybe E2 when I first came into this country, which was 2000 and, no, 1999. Um, you go to a bookshop and you say, okay, I want, I want to buy some Chinese books. And they, they, they would look at you blankly and be like, we, 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 have a, we have a copy, we have a really rapid copy of the Art of War somewhere that I'm sure we can find. But, um, and then you'd say, okay, well, we want to do an event around Chinese New Year. They would look at you, back at you, and it's like, what do you mean Chinese New Year? New Year's already gone. <laughs> and maybe like, and then over the kind of last 20 years as kind of China's modernized and as China has kind of changed its relationship to the world, I mean, people have begun to sort of pay more attention to it, definitely. And, um, and it's, they, now you, now, for example, for example, when my mother has uh, uh, started doing her job, she, you could get into a meeting with a buyer. Whereas when I first came to this country, you probably couldn't have. Mm -hmm. But when she got into a meeting with a buyer, she took like a massive tub of books in there and said, okay, would you like to stock any of these? And literally the buyer kind of put one tub on the, on the table, the other tub on the floor and kind of like looked at the thing, threw it on the th tub on the floor, looked at the thing, threw it on the tub on the floor, looked at the thing, kept it on the table. Like, Let's just say most of the tub ended up on the floor. <laughs> and, and, and like, that's absolutely, that's absolutely kind of right, right? They, they have to look after their bottom line. It's, it's like, if they don't think it's gonna sell, it's probably not gonna sell. And now we're, we're in a stage where people are kind of interested about China because there's a lot, I mean, right now, like look at, look at where we are right now. I mean, it's, we, we were actually working on a book on Wuhan. Uh, uh, two years ago, and we were sitting down at editorial meetings and so we're like, we're not sure if people have actually heard about Wuhan before. <laughs> <laughs> the world was about to change that. <laughs> like, how do we, how, like, I remember, like, it was part of the, the cover, and we're like, uh, maybe we shouldn't put Wuhan in the cover, because no one's, they're like, that's not the keyword anyone would recognize. <laughs> and, and now, now, I mean, it's, Decisions made over there is starting to affect stuff that's happening here, right? And with that comes a, a, at least a desire to understand it. And I think that's where we're really thankful for where we're being where we are because it's, it's literature is a window into understanding another culture, how they think, how they, how, they, how, they, how they make the decisions that they do. And for example, Chinese people have the understanding the West for uh, since at least when I was young through literature. I mean, maybe not very accurately. For example, I remember the story of like a person coming over here and being really disappointed no one's in a ball gown, but. Uh, <laughs> a little disappointed by that every day. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they're, they're starting to understand it. And what we're really hoping to do really, and what we're uh, uniquely what we're here to, that we can do now is that maybe through this understanding we can promote at least a, a, a better, like more, more, more conversations, more interesting conversations than simply like what's been going on currently, you know? And uh, I'm not sure if that answered your question or not. <laughs> oh no, it absolutely did. It absolutely did. I think it's really interesting because, um, you know, my first interaction with Chinese literature was absolutely wild swans. And, you know, you a, great, a great book, but I'm also sure mm. that's many, of viewers <laughs> first interactions as well and then sort of I was lucky enough to um meet bump into Jinran a few times and then yeah and sort of do a she's little great. she's honestly the nicest person right. I, I Sorry, was no I was working and my job was to be like you know have you eaten do you need anything like are you okay and she was like what about you are you okay and I was like no one's under us. <laughs> like, that's your run. That's your run. Yes, she's amazing. She's she's doing fantastic work for uh, mothers. Uh, mothers for the Links in the description below. <laughs> yeah, 
she is she is she really really is and so like like she and uh, like young, young Chang have been sort of there creating these works but like they are still maybe like you said like it's one it's one perspective um you know and it's so great that uh to hear that like and to watch um sort of many more books come through in addition um it's yeah. it's 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 something I'm I'm really thankful for where I, I can be where I am and it's it's I would say probably when I was younger this this opportunity didn't really, really exist and I'm, I'm, I'm really, like part of part of uh, what, what gets me up in the day every morning is like to kind of say like oh wow I'm, I'm working on something that like is really cool you know <laughs> <laughs> what might like a day-to-day -day, day look like um, uh... <laughs> <laughs> put you on the spot but I guess yeah yeah I mean, for, for me, myself, my, my role is primarily production. So this is shuttling from raw manuscript from a translator to, um, to, uh, to final finished product and that and all the steps there in between. And sometimes my role even goes back into like, for example, giving some feedback and research to, for example, translators. Should I, should I give you a full rundown of the whole pipeline? Oh, okay. please do. So um, we we essentially when when a when a manuscript gets suggested, we get a Chinese script, uh, a Chinese manuscript for it, and then we would go to a try we try we try and our very best to kind of pair it up with the best possible translator we can find for it, especially in, for example in subject track matter. One translator who's really familiar with one part of China might not necessarily be familiar with another part of China, and. It's uh, out of finding the manuscript is about going through a process of like uh, uh, liaison, like for example, obviously the translator has to do the work and have to render the translation. But for example, sometimes they might have questions or for example, specific cultural quirks that they never heard of before. And at that point we would help them, for example, do research. We would liaise with say the author or specialists or stuff like that. So for example, one of the examples I remember is a book we worked on where there's a lot of military ranks and the military ranks is one of those things where like it's unique to each culture so you're, you're basically you're looking i was at one point i was looking at like a full list of british military ranks and full list of chinese military ranks in chinese i was like looking looking between the two i'm like these two do not match up at all <laughs> um, imagine oh my god what a nightmare <laughs> and it's about kind of navigating your way through that until you arrive at finished english manuscript at which point uh, it gets handed off into the editors who run a, a first pass at it, kind of addressing any sort of like uh, continuity issues or, for example, or naming issues and, and kind of making sure that like the copy sings brilliantly as much as it could be, because as good as a translator might be, um, they're not editors and editors, they're, they're different, the different set of requirements right? and, and editors always a fresh pair of eyes on it, right? And then after that, it gets handed off to my team, which I'm kind of running the day to day of, which is basically by, by uh, and uh, we, 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 we typeset the manuscript, we kind of figure out, like, for example, Chinese books always have these kind of really interesting structures. So, for example, one of the books we're working on right now, it's called uh, Joda Sin's Longevity Park, and it's structured as essentially a week long calendar of talks in a park in the middle of Beijing called Longevity Park. And it was about figuring out like, okay, how do we structure, how does, how does that work in a book? <laughs> and kind of like, so we ended up having this kind of like, kind of little like flyer thing at the beginning, which basically acts as a glossary, but at the same, uh, not a glossary, like a kind of table of contents, but at the same time, it's like, it's displaying a little like kind of, uh, displayed as a little kind of flyer for like people like promotional material and stuff like that. And then after that, it gets uh, passed back to the editor. But at that point, we have an understanding of the book now. So we start, now we start kind of spinning away at sort of like, okay, uh, what is the key aspects of this book? What, what should go, what should the cover design look like? What should like the blurb look like? And what, what is this book kind of would be compared against if it gets released in an English context? And, and what should everything like that look like? So for example, you probably don't want your a uh, really dark story of, uh, of uh, kind of kidnapping to look like a romance book or stuff like that, basically. <laughs> and um, and uh, you, you go through that whole process and then uh, there's back and forth with the author, which has to kind of, you have to communicate with them because they, they get a say in this whole process as well because fundamentally it's their baby. And 
Um, one of the actually one of the really interesting stories I have I had a really pleasure working on is a, a book called uh, My Travels in Dinghy. It's about this author called. Hello, if anybody wants it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I actually think I picked this one at random. I really? think that, yeah, I think um when was it? I don't know, it was a few months ago now. Um and I actually think this was on back order. I think I had to wait like six weeks to get it or something. Oh no. Yeah, no, no, like no, not bad at all. Like it was fine. <laughs> it was no um but um yeah, I, I I really fancied it. I haven't read it yet, but I'm excited to. <laughs> it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a difficult read because Essentially, the author Shi Tietchan, he is—he's one of those figures what's known as he's—he got—he's one of the sent down youth, essentially, where these urban intellectual kids got sent down to the countryside to work, and unfortunately, he uh, through that he he developed damage in the spine, essentially, and for the rest of his life he was crippled by that. He couldn't walk ever again past that, and so his writings are very, very much like. It's very much focused internally, and it's very kind of um, self-respective, and it's very it's it's beautiful it's it's beautiful and it's beautiful in in the in the sense of like a, in the original Chinese beautiful because a lot of it's a lot of it what made it beautiful is unique to Chinese and how Chinese kind of gets displayed out, and that book in particular is the last book he ever wrote before he died in 2010, and. It really was an attempt for him to get like some of his Wilder's ideas on paper. I think personally, that's what I think personally. That's what he was trying to do. And one of the when we got started working on the book, say, oh, was it 2017, 2018? Obviously, the author wasn't around to kind of clarify things anymore. And one of the really things, one of the really things we we're really grateful for is that the rights people that we signed the book with managed to get us in touch with the original Chinese editor of the book. And she was at hand to kind of sort of act as an intermediary about some of like trying to clarify a few ideas and that like it's it, it's it's small things like that that it's like oh that's really nice that's really nice because that editor is like she had first hand interaction with the author and, and it's yes yeah, it's, it was just it was just one of those things that like I I kind of I, I still remember and it's it's that's still not exactly a smile to my face but I was like oh nice. Um, Anyway, so yeah, we, we get to that stage and then eventually we get to um, we get to a printed galley copy and a printed a print edition and uh, ebook edition. And that's when I take my production hat off and take, put my marketing cap up on and uh, shake hands and everything and um, up shoulders. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, we uh, we we look for uh, examples like opportunities of events that will people be interested in this and audiences that which like is close to what this book is but like slightly different. So for example, right now for Feng Jitai, like I mentioned previously, he's a traditionally trained artist, right, and he's responsible for cultural preservation in China. So we managed to put uh, get a, get in touch with uh, Sotheby Inst Sotheby's Institute of Arts East Asia Division uh, East Asia Department where they have a lady there, Katie Hill, she's great. And she, like to kind of talk, like talk about events more closer to his art. But the thing is, is that since this book is so intrinsically linked in his art, I mean, let's face it, there's, there's drawings on the inside, right? So, so um, it, it really is like the people that would be interested in that would also be interested in this book. And it's about developing audiences that way. And that's, uh, in my daily job is about like finding like, working out all the kind of intricacies of that. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're no stranger to it yourself. And it's about um, working out all, all of the kind of intricacies that way. Okay. And uh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, it's always the, like, sometimes things like that bring up the best opportunities. Exactly. Like something, because like, it's somebody who has a passion, but maybe for a slightly different thing than you, but then they like align in this amazing way. It's, it's 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 really good when when you can make that happen. It like it, it puts a warm feeling in my heart, definitely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sorry. What were you gonna go on? Did I cut off? Uh, no. I mean, uh, from there, from that point of view, it's about like, for example, pitching, uh, pitching uh, reviews, pitching, uh, pitching segments, serials, and stuff like that. That we're still getting better at. 
uh, on a on a day to day basis. It's from from kind of my background point of view, perhaps it's like what is least being informed. It's least it's, it's now it's now we're getting way far from like kind of isometric drawings on my architecture background, right? And and um, and really, it's about kind of building it like for that, where, where for example, we recently, uh, the Irish Times recently carried a review, a really great review. Thank you, Ronan. Ronan Hessian. Uh, over at, uh, oh, I know Ronan. Uh, have, you, have you interviewed him? No, yeah. I haven't interviewed him, but he does, um, he comes to Boardless Book Club sometimes. And then I actually met him there without sort of realizing about all his wonderful books. And then sort of, yeah. I, I love Leonard and Hungry Paul. I love, love, love Leonard and Hungry Paul. <laughs> That that first that first paragraph with the father dying, I was like, I was like, oh okay, it's gonna be one of those books, huh? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Ronan's links down below as well. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, and it, they recently carried a really, really nice review for us in the Irish Times, which like the office like kind of erupted. As you see the Slack feed, it's like really long, and um, and <laughs> that's it, the virtual erupting office <laughs> these days. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah it's it, like finding finding opportunities like that and kind of getting books out to people and just getting generating general buzz you know these are exciting books people should be excited and i that it's like it's about it's about letting them trying to get them to see what you're seeing and it's it's yeah it's it's fun <laughs> Oh, I can't, I can't thank you enough, Daniel. I've had so, so enjoyed this conversation. Thank you very um, much. Honestly, and all the work you do is, um, and sort of as a publisher that Alan Charles Publishing does is amazing and it's so exciting. And um, I wondered if sort of to wrap up, um, you wanted to like say anything sort of, I mean, we've touched on loads of unique points and notable points about Chinese literature um, throughout this talk. I think this question has become slightly less um, important now, but I was wondering if there was anything you wanted to finish on about like what is um, important to you um, about your reading um, through Chinese literature. Important to me, I mean, for me personally, from my point of view, it's about kind of, I, grew up in China. I mean, I spent my first nine years in China. So I, I actually went to a year of Chinese primary school. And, but the thing is, is that I grew up in urban China and I grew up in kind of Beijing and it's, Beijing is its own thing. And it's, 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 it's as different, for example, you go to Beijing and China, it's as different as can be basically. And for me, it's really about kind of through my, one of the things I'm really happy about is, is that through my work, I can kind of rediscover mm where it is I came from sort of thing. And that that's really meaningful to me. Like it's, it's, it, it, I mean, it's, it's one of those things where like you grow up, you don't realize how important those things were until it's passed you by. Yeah. And it's, and it's now that like, I'm really grateful that I have this kind of second chance for myself, for me. And Again, like I really hope, I'd like to think that maybe I'm not the only person that's experiencing like this. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to think that maybe like through my work, it, it, will be, it will be possible to kind of help people, other people to experience the same thing that I'm experiencing. And that's again, really meaningful to me. And I don't know, it's, it's it, I mean, it, it's one of those things where you kind of think about when you, right before you go to bed, and it's, it's for the day to day, you're just kind of frustrated that like, ah, oh, my printer delivery is not getting delivered. Ah! <laughs> um, <laughs> Yesterday was very much one of those days to me. I know exactly what you mean. And then the, things like this happen, mm. like this talk, and it brings it all back. Into exactly, exactly. And it's, a, it's, it's nice to get that out there. Like, I don't, I don't think I've really actually talked about that before. It's nice to, it's nice to get that out there. Mm. And it's, and it's, it will be, I don't know, it's, it's, I, I take I take great joy in my work, and it's it's it, it's one of those things where it's hopefully as I get better at it, we will like for example I uh, I'll help reach out. It's developing basically. I need to get better at the animator pitch basically. <laughs> <laughs> and the best way, you know, I'm learning on the job. <laughs> you realize what you don't know. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Oh, 
so tell like when is gonna happen yeah, not, tell me more about like what, what's what when's when what's the program on that like let's let's look about it <laughs> Ah, oh, thank you. Um, so the program is, um, it starts on Saturday, unbelievably. <laughs> um, a bit like, you know, I had, that's why yesterday I had a moment like, oh, oh, Saturday, Saturday, okay, we'll be ready. <laughs> um, but it's, um, yeah, I'm quite, you know, knock on wood, pleased with the program this year. I hope people like it. Um, and it's um, tried to be, you know, um, last year was a, a quick turnaround and I was very much like reaching to people that I, if not knew was somewhat in the orbit of, and you know, like had this sort of like, no, like knew, had read before, things like this. Um, whereas this year there's definitely been um, sort of me and my colleague Will, who we do the programming, we have sort of, you know, trying to push ourselves further. Um, and in particular, um, sort of Will has done a, a series on like Creoles, and Creole languages so very pleased with that series and so that was sort of Will's he did like he loves Linton Quasey Johnson and so he sort of that was his um like little bit there um and then we've also done um several BSL talks and like British Sign Language and there's one with um a woman called um Rachel Sutton Spence and um, it's about sign language poetry and um storytelling and literature and it's she signs through poetry yeah, oh like not even it's like my oh, work it's it honestly has made me realize how unsatisfying um spoken languages are and how much you can do in a signed visual language um because it's about how like um i mean it's i think she says it's film-like you know, like there's just this whole element of which you're like telling poems and stories and doing all these clever things. So like um, an example I remember is uh, there's this sign, which mm -hmm. can mean phone um, and can mean something else. And basically cow, cow maybe. And they sort of, this woman has written this poem where it's all, she uses just the one sign but like you like uses it all these ways to yeah it's amazing and that's sort of what's something that's fascinating about it as well is that I don't sign but you can understand yeah like like enough of what's going on um and so it, yeah that was that's been truly um different for me wow <laughs> love wow it. I, I is there a recording on it? I'd love to see it. Yes. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's coming out on Saturday. That's coming out. Uh, can't wait. Oh, uh, well, one of the things I saw recently is, is that apparently we're dating ourselves now by doing this. Oh, because that's what we think of a phone as. What's the new one? <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Because I actually had a conversation with a guy called Adam who signs and he was saying how, um, you know, his dad would sign phone like with like a rotary dial. And so how this was like the new phone, but of course <laughs> we're out of date. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh gosh. Oh. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, I'm through his, there's just a lot of lovely translators as well. The sort of like core programming. Yeah, you managed to get in touch with Helen Wong? Yes. And yes, yes. What, what are they going to talk about? You um, know, so, um, so children's books mostly. Uh -huh. So Helen and Nikki did a talk, I filmed it last week, um, and they talked a bit about um, Yanger's White Horse, Bronze and Sunflower. Bronze and Sunflower. <laughs> Have you read it? Like... It's on my list. It's on my list. I will. I will. It's it's, it's amazing. I take it. Yes. Like, I like genuinely one of those books that I would recommend to anyone. Like you know, it's children's, but it's it's for everyone. It's and it's a very tight story. You know, when something's just like very like, I always I always feel like writing is like twenty percent writing, eighty percent editing, and that like a lot of sort of what maybe like you know, good authors, but not great authors do is like, if they could just edit, like cut half of everything <laughs> and then and then you'd see what you were left with and whatever. Um, and the, um, 
I feel like bronze and sunflower is like that. Like I feel like there is, it's just really, really tight and yeah. It's I, like, I remember when it won the Hans Christian Andersen, it was like the, the, the kind of Chinese CDE marks went up for a oh, kind of thing. It was, it was, it was, it was a real, I think that, that book really smarked off the kind of children's thing, children's way that's kind of going through CD right now. And it's, it's, it's great, just great. It's just a great thing to think. Helen did fantastic work. Yes, I can agree. Well, and also like children's tends to lead because it obviously trickles in, doesn't it? Like later mm. down the line, um, you know. It's like, your future, it's your future. It's my future customers. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow. Well, thank you. Yes. And uh, shall we? Shall we wrap it up there? Or yeah, let's wrap it up there. Um, so thank you so much, Daniel. Um, I can't thank you enough. Um, thank you. Thank time. you for so thank you for speaking to me. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. And um, if anybody would like to see more, would like to order some books <laughs> down below. Um, and um, sort of also do pay attention to all the events you do, the events Paper Republic does, the events that Gangwa Bookshop does. Um, there's a whole like ecosystem there. Ooh, can is... I do a quick plug? Yes. Can I do a quick plug? We have two events coming up. Uh, when is this going up? Um, this is going up on Sunday, I think. Okay. Okay, so it's, it, it's, it's, it's too late for the Sunday. We have an event on Saturday. No, anyway, we have an event with the Sotheby's Institute of Art containing Feng Di Tai, and it's about his uh, it's about his art writing and the preservation of old Tianjin. And it will be uh, we have an event right up there, and with everyone, it's a free Zoom event. Everyone's more than welcome to come and experience, and uh, we we hope to see you there. Um, I will I'll put out some tweets as well. Yes, um, yes, thank you. <laughs> not at all. There we are, doing our proper marketing roles here. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much. And thank you, thank you very much for watching. Um, if you'd like to see more events from us, um, also click down below and see you all soon. Bye.